I have an important subject to discuss with you. Uh, during the last few years, here in the Westward Ho, we have had leaders, and generally this is what you will get in subsidized housing. You will get natural born leaders, but many times they are outlaws, meaning that they don't exactly uh, line up all the time with what you might call insight. They tend to, their education tends to be spotty and, but they have, always have charisma and the ability to persuade people, charm them, uh, and so they get followers to support them. And I spent considerable time, I have spent considerable time in this complex fighting, interacting with this type of leader whenever I would see that he was running amok or he was leading us off the cliff <laughs> was doing something that was going to disturb the peace possibly profoundly so I call them out if I think the situation is getting bad and since we've had death threats in here for quite some time, I consider this a time when the people, the men who are vying for our leadership are natural born leaders, but they have traits that I would say put them into the outlaw class. So you have to react when that type of leader, and this is another reason why I'm no longer in a public place. For one thing, I don't think it's fair for one group of people to dominate in, say, the people's room, the tenant's room. I think that there should be changes, that new people should come in, they should run the tenants organization. They should have their turn. And when some one person tries to too hard to be that leader, and I'm going to question this as to whether, and I'm going to look at his past as a leader, as a president, and say, well, what did he do? Do we want him again? And I think that's perfectly fair, sensible, that's what we should do. And I've had clashes with Victor, who is organized this present tenant organization, the WRAI. And I told him, I said, Victor, you've been president for nine years. You've no longer got the, you should let somebody else be a lead, be president. Well, sometimes they don't want to let go of that, you know, power. And actually, there'd be greater power if they did let go of it. And so, right now, I would say that I'm having major clash with three outlaw-type leaders in this complex. And what I'm trying to prevent is a violent death. Because when there's death threats, you've got to say, Okay, when is this madman who's writing these death threats going to lose all control of himself and decide to go further? So I think you have to take precautions. You have to, and because I dealt so long with one of the toughest, smartest, meanest, strong-willed outlaw types there ever was, my dad, I worked with him, I fought with him, 
I took care of him when he was dying. I helped bury him. But let me tell you, this man could be a son of a bitch. Don't kid yourself. Uh, I even had to deal with the possibility that he might molest yes, my son. And so I had to guard him, watch him, make sure that he didn't get off somewhere in some faraway place with my grandson, his grandson, my son. And that is one of the toughest battles you can ever fight. And one of the most upsetting. Because I was finally seeing in his rebellion, in his life of secrets and affairs, that he had probably at some point taken forced, younger cowboys, in their teens, possibly. Because there's just a fine line when you are deceiving your wife, your mother, your everybody. It's not too big of a jump to go after a young kid that isn't even of age, that might even be in your family. So, when I saw this happening, I had to get tough. I had to get very tough. And so when I get, and I've been in subsidized housing 28 years, and the other one that I came from was far more violent than this one. There was guns. I saw a man shot right outside my door. Another was in the drug dealer, the, lo the woman who sold drugs in the complex, in there, and he was trying to rob her, and two illegals came out of the kitchen and shot him five times. I knew that guy. I talked to him any number of times. He'd already been shot twice. This time, he didn't make it. He swelled up with five shots in him. He was gone. So, I know, I know when there is a violent incident, I've experienced them. So when things get violent in here, I'm going to do everything possible I can to take steps to calm things down, talk to these leaders. And if they don't want to talk to me, that is the sign to me that they're not thinking. They're not thinking fast enough and good enough for the power they wield. If you, would, if you have influence over people, to me, you're obligated to think well, to do your homework, to admit your faults. Now, that's very hard for proud men, outlaws to do. They can't admit when they're wrong. They'll just try to... And I, I train myself to say, okay, don't admit it. I won't harass. I won't quarrel. I'll just go away. But I won't leave the complex. I'll stay here and I'll say, you're not going to run me out of here. And you're going to learn how to behave if you want to stay in here and have, have a peaceful time. Because you're not going to take over this complex and run it any damn way you please. No. You're going to be, need to be able to hear about your faults. Answer what to what people have seen you do with their own eyes, heard you say, you have to be responsible for those things. That's what I tell outlaws. And if you can't be responsible for what you yourself have said and done, and you just want to bully people, 
try to get them to them to back down, not you. That means you're an outlaw. And that means that you can't admit when you're wrong. And that is a very big weakness. Everybody needs to look at themselves, especially if they don't want the humiliation of eventually a policeman telling them they're wrong, taking them off to jail. The best thing to do is look at their own behavior, their own behavior, and be ready to admit. Be ready to say, okay, what did I do? And you say, you said this, you did this. And take it, if that's what you did. Because there's too many people surrounding a leader who see what they do. It's just not possible. And this is what is challenging, is when this kind of leader comes into a place where people are observing him, they're watching him, they're paying attention to what he says. Now that is good, if you can take it. If you can't take it, it's going to bother you, mother an outlaw. But, boy, I said to myself, after fighting with my dad as hard and long as I did, and getting him taken care of, and dying without killing somebody, without doing some horrible thing that he threatened to do, without molesting my grandson, his grandson and my son. And I called my grandson later and I said, did, did he ever touch you? He was going to pay him to sleep in the same bed with him. How would you like that? And there was a friend who was letting her in-laws take care of her kids. Finally, her little six-year-old girl told her, well, Grandpa's coming in. When he says good night, and he he's he's messing with us, <gasps> so they told the grandpa, and he took a gun and held it to his head and shot himself. What a horrible thing to happen to a family. Uh, and the dad and the the son, the father of the children, had to come home to his dad. And his wife was upset because she couldn't put him in jail. Well, she should have been on the watch too, just like I had to be. She should keep her eyes open. She should say, this is what I mean by being a detective. You sometimes have to be a very good detective to keep people from running, you know, like very strong, well, powerful, to keep them check. It's not very tough to do. Very tough. But it's the first job. I consider this. When I meet an outlaw type who's out of control in a number of ways, I think the first thing this guy has to do is get himself under control. Before he can do anything, anything that's worth doing, he has to look at himself and see what he's doing that might be wrong because a lot of times that's what you see. You see a man who desperately wants to be a leader but he doesn't want to do the work. He does not want to go over his behavior, whatever he's done. He doesn't want to listen to what people thought about this. He just... And then that person, when he doesn't want to listen He's showing a little bit of insanity because everybody has to listen and has to account for their behaviors. And if these behaviors lead to upsets, uh, tenants being abused or something said to them that shouldn't be said, a fight that isn't fair, a a exploiting of their emotions. This all has to come into play and there has to be watchdogs in the organization who are going to see that nothing happens that shouldn't. 
And so that's my role. It's a thankless role for lots of times, but it's a role that I've played many times in life because there's not enough police officers, there's not enough law enforcement in the whole world to stop a lot of things from happening that we ourselves have to stop right within our own environment. Like I've heard subsidized housing overrun by crime, they have to take it back. The people who live in it, who benefit from it, have to take it back and they have to fight. The outlaw who comes in and could possibly be very good for the complex, but he's not going to be good if he cannot, you cannot talk to him, you cannot criticize him, let him criticize you, let you criticize him, but it has to go both ways. Both have to be able to take it, or otherwise it's not fair. And men constantly run over women because they don't want to take criticism. That's simple. 